Well, good day, everyone. Welcome to this CoachNet GPS webinar on first steps for planting a missional church. And we appreciate you taking an hour of your time today to join us for this webinar. My name is John Van Bruggen, and I am your host for today's event. Um, today's webinar will focus on the third step of planting a missional church, and that is building a launch team. Our presenter today is Gary Rohrmeyer, as he has been for our previous webinars on first steps. And Gary is the National Director of Converge USA. Before we get started, I'd like to do two things. Uh, one, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about yourself. And so I'm going to start a poll here. And if you can um, take a minute just to answer uh, your connection to church planting, we'd appreciate knowing that information about you. Um, also, while you're doing that, uh, those of you who uh, have been with us before know that there are some features on your, your screen that you can use to communicate with me as your host. And so if you have a question at any time for Gary um, throughout the webinar, or if you're experiencing technical difficulties or, or have a question for me as your host, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen, and I'll be glad to communicate with you that way. Uh, the second thing I would like to do is, is for us just, just take a moment um, to spend in silence to center ourselves and to acknowledge that, that God is here. He's with us um, in this moment. And so let's take a few moments uh, of silence to center ourselves. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. And now here is our presenter, Gary Rohrmeyer. Hey, well, good afternoon, everybody. Glad you're joining us uh, for this, uh, I think, third edition or fourth edition of our uh, of our webinars, free webinars for planting a missional church. I just wanted to uh, kind of go over um, uh, the goal of First Steps, which I do every time. And uh, our goal is very simple. It's our desire to help you discover the church that God has planted in your heart and to help that become a reality. We're not, I'm not here to promote a certain style or model because uh, I believe that we're going to, it's going to take a multitude of churches to reach the multitudes in our cities, countries, and world. And so you'll hear me talk about um, uh, you know, different models but really, when we talk about those models, we want to look at the missional principles that drive those models. Here's the uh, um, uh, kind of the overview of the uh, first steps process, uh, the three biblical concepts uh, that really provide the foundation for church planting out of the glory of God, the mission of God, and the kingdom of God. And then we've developed these uh, stages and uh or steps as you want to call them but the the first the the first step is uh you know basically um relating with god and others and uh you know god is the one who's building the church and we need to uh have a have a uh, good spiritual foundation in our lives and in that uh, in that first section which you can go back and look at uh we talk about the, the spiritual formation of the planter we talk about the spiritual leadership, and then we talk about how to develop an intercessory team and also how to develop a, a financial team. Then our last uh, session that we went through, we talked about networking and gathering. You know, what do you, how do you enter a community missionally? And uh, we gave some great practical insights there. Today's session is on uh, building, building a launch team. And uh, so as you gather people, as you reach people, you pull them in, in together to develop this uh, launch team uh, that will eventually launch the church. You know, building a team is one of the most rewarding and, and yet challenging activities a leader, a leader can uh, find themselves in. And, um, uh, you know, church planting is a team sport. And throughout uh, the New Testament, we see people working in community, laboring side by side, and making every sacrifice to achieve the goal of being actively engaged in God's, in God's mission. You know, in Acts uh, chapter 1, verses 12 to 14, we see the fruits, fruit of, of Jesus' effort in building a team that was used to launch the church, uh, the church in a, in a very spectacular way in Acts, in Acts 2. 
you know, I, I as I read that passage this morning in preparation for this, I just um, um, kind of read it slowly and read the names and uh, and was reminded of the people who were a part of the different launch teams that I had the privilege of uh, one being a part of. Uh, our family's been a part of four church plants, uh, two as interns and now one as a pioneer planter and then now uh, one uh, the current church we're a part of we're really actually more lay people uh, in that uh, in that church that we're a part of right now but I just think of the names you know uh, of the people who were courageous enough to join the team to say you know what we want to be a part of starting starting a new church and so that's one of the things that I want you to think about I want you to think about what what will your team look like? Who are the names that will be on your list? You know, and, uh, you know, I could still remember the names. You know, the first people we reached, you know, uh, Paul and Patty and and Julie and Jim and and, uh, Debbie and Misty and Dwayne and and all these people that, uh, you know, uh, some of them came to Christ, some of them came back to Christ and help form our little launch team uh, to launch our church, which is, you know, 20 years later, still going, still going strong, and uh, what, what an honor and privilege uh, to be a part of that. Well, as a church planter, you have a, this is a, you have a great opportunity to build a team, and uh, we want to encourage you to do it prayerfully. We want to encourage you to do it with skill, and we want to encourage you to do it with wise counsel. And uh, today we're going to provide just a few things um, on on in this session about how to build uh, a launch team first thing we need to look at uh, here's here's actually the questions we're going to answer today what is a launch team how do you build agenda harmony Uh, what is an advisory team Uh, that is kind of an initial initial leadership structure within the new church and then how how do you how do you uh, uh, keep the the evangelist fervor um, high in, in the new church Here's a graph I like to use in the, to, to set the example of the stages of an the early stages of a church plant. First, you have the planter. The planter gets out there and networks like crazy. Uh, one of the things I tell our church planters to do is that they need to just continually meet people. We we avidly practice what we what I call the the three by five rule is that you need to get five contacts a day. That's about 35 a week. And you need to at least generate at least um, um, three sit-downs uh, with people, either to share the vision, to recruit them to your team, or to share the gospel with them. And so um, if you go to my blog, uh, GaryRormeyer.com, and just uh, even Google the 3 by 5 rule, uh, I've got a good post on that for that. But, but the planter needs to get out there and get his name out there. He needs to, and he needs to get as many people out there who are going to know who he is and why he's in that in that city and then there's the gathering stage when you start gathering groups of people together and uh, we went into that in depth last time and uh, there's many vehicles of, of gathering people gathering people in a pr- in prayer groups gathering gathering people in seeker studies gathering people in discipleship studies but just gathering kind of what I say strike when the iron's hot Get people together as soon as you can. And then out of that, you want to build what we call a launch team. When you begin gathering these people together for the purpose of starting starting a new church. Well, uh, what is a launch team? Well, there's a, the, there's a big dis, uh, uh, discrepancy between what we call a core group and a launch team. Now, back in my day, when I first was a part of starting churches we always call them core groups well um, let me uh, let me show you the difference between a core group and a launch team a core group is the number of people as uh, a number of Christians who have been gathered as a Bible study with the goal of starting a new church uh, here is uh, some of the uh, things involved in that they may or may not view the church planter as a leader they may or may not see themselves as followers uh, usually um, does not have a stated purpose or definable end, often uh, fosters an us-centeredness, and, uh, and often it's difficult for new people to break in when you have this what we call a core group kind of mentality. 
Um, over the years, we've learned a lesson to move from away from core groups to more of a launch team posture. Here's what a launch team is. A launch team is a group of evangelistic bringers who have uh, been selected and trained by the church planter. Here's a couple things. Launch team, uh, launch team, uh, the launch team establishes the church planter as their servant leader. Uh, it establishes the participants as servant followers, has a clearly stated purpose and goal with a definable termination, uh, definable term, termination point. Fosters more of an other-centeredness and avoids, uh, helps avoid the insider-outsider distinction. Uh, this came, I, I love Tim Keller's definition here. He really clearly articulates this uh, very well. You know, here, here's the thing that happens. Some people think it's just semantics. Well, it, it is, but it, it's really important because uh, in my first church plant that I was a part of, I we had about uh, 14 to uh, about 14 adults and 14 kids on our initial launch team. A lot of those people are people that we reached uh, with the gospel. And uh, and what happened is is that we spent nine months together, kind of in the womb, uh, building this team. And um, uh, and then when we launched the church, we went we went from 25 to 110, and it was amazing how this core group had this mentality of well. Uh, I don't care about those people. I only care about the core group. And I was like, what did I spend the last nine months trying to train these people in 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 uh, in reaching out and and in, in encouraging others? And um, and eventually, what happened is that within the first six months, I had to kill the core and uh, and and just tell them we're going to cease calling ourselves the core group. Um, and uh, because the core of the church really begins to be built after the church is launched and one of the things that you can you can uh, save yourself a lot of problems is by using this launch team ter terminology we've actually found in in recent church plants i've been a part of is that when we use the launch term term uh, language the actually this the launch team stays longer in the life of the church uh, back in my day 20 years ago when i first planted it was a very, um, uh, it was pretty standard practice that you were not going to see, um, you know, uh, people would say all the time, don't be surprised that uh, if half of, your, half of your core group is gone after you've launched a church in a year. Um, and, uh, and actually, we've seen that percentage go up when we use this launch team uh, terminology. So... Uh, that's what we're calling a, a launch team. That's the definition of that. Let's go on. Let's talk about uh, how do you build agenda harmony. And uh, building agenda harmony is really critical, and we see the, the spiritual principle here, Paul talking to the Philippian church and just encouraging them, you know, to, you know, to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of, the, worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my, in my absence, I will know that you, here, stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. And that whole contending and striving, you know, getting a group of people to lock arms together and say, you know what, we're moving forward, you know, for the, to see the gospel advanced in our community. Now, Agenda Harmony doesn't happen by accident. It takes work. It takes work on the, on the planter's um, behalf. Paul says, you know, later on in Philippians, he says, you know, make my joy complete by being what? Like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit and purpose. Uh, there are a lot of people who are going to want to be a part of your church plant that have, have uh, you know, different ideas. And uh, as a planter, you need to work hard at uh, developing uh, the agenda uh, harmony in your, in your launch team. We have actually, on, in the First Steps Network, there are actually tools uh, and uh, surveys that we've developed to really help uh, church planters kind of flesh out what are some of the potential problems that take place uh, in a church over this issue. The key to Agenda Harmony is to having a, a clearly articulated uh, biblical values 
that are ranked in order of, imp order of importance and can be measured over time. Now, here's, here's one of my little pet peeves with uh, church planners today is that a lot of times we, we borrow and steal and use other, other people's um, values, value statements, and I think you need to take time and really work on these because I really believe that churches don't fight over, uh, have uh, you know, conflict over vision. Where the real conflict comes is is where is in the in the outworking of the vision, which is really articulated in your values. And um, and uh, I love you know I heard uh, Ken Blanchard say at a, a seminar once. He said, you know, you when you when you develop a set of values, operational values for your organization, you need to rank them in order of importance. What are the non-negotiables? And uh, to you personally. And I think, you know, I really encourage church planters to sit down and think about that. You know, what are, what are the non-negotiables? Uh, the church that our family is a part of right now, um, I remember our pastor getting up in the, in the launch team phase, and he basically said our number one value, our number one, of our, our number one value is going to be evangelism. And, uh, you know, and, and I think we had about 80 people at a launch team meeting uh, that that we were we were developing and recruiting people to, and he basically said our number of, number one value is going to be uh, evangelism. He said I'm not starting this church so that you can have a church that's more convenient for you to drive to, uh, but I'm starting this church to impact and transform this city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, our launch team went from 80 to about 40 the next week, and uh, but he set he set the agenda and. Uh, um, and, and clearly, clearly articulated that. Here's uh, just a set, a sample set of uh, of some values that uh, I encourage church planners to uh, to when they when they build their values. I think about uh, I want them to think about how they can measure them. And one of the great things, if uh, I know many of you are, are uh, familiar with the natural church development, uh, the NCD process, and the eight characteristics of a, of, a, of, a, of a healthy church. And what I encourage them to do is to build their values around uh, those eight characteristics of a healthy church. Because the great thing is that a year later, you can actually go through the survey and, uh, um, and do the NCD survey and measure the effectiveness of your values. And, and so it's a great tool uh, to look at. And so here, you know, if I was going to be starting a church today, I mean, this is the way, this is the, I ranked them in order of importance to me, and, uh, and here's, here's where I would start um, and, uh, and, and look at uh, our values. And then I would do the survey every year to measure uh, how effective we are in, uh, in, in living those out. Um, Here's a little diagram that will uh, that helps you look see the importance of agenda harmony. You know, the fact is that we can be standing side by side and then have some what I call value differences. Okay, but here's the big principle: the longer you walk together, if there's significant value differences, the longer you walk together, the farther you'll drift apart. And, uh, and so. For instance, um, you know, and the big separation there is values. What will happen, though, is that uh, some crisis will take place, and then you will separate over some matter. Now, we see this in the life of Paul and Barnabas. And, uh, and we see that in Acts you know, 15, they separated. You know, they had a sharp disagreement and separated. And there, were, there was a, a values uh, issue there. I mean, uh, Barnabas was more relational. Barnabas wanted to give uh, um, uh, John Mark a second chance. Paul was more task-driven and saying, you know what, that kid burned me once. I'm not going to let him burn me again. And, uh, and basically that value separation eventually uh, came out in a crisis and the team separated. And so the fact is that's why you need to do the upfront work in your church plant in, in working through those um, working through your value statements using the Agenda Harmony survey tools that we have uh, developed. 
the second, the third question is uh, how do you build uh, an advisory team? How do you build an advisory team? Um, here, here's the basic concept of an advisory team. You know, it comes out of First Timothy, the whole idea of don't be hasty in the laying of, on of hands. You know, one of the things that happens in new churches is that uh, planters uh, appoint leadership, formal leadership, way too early in the process. They don't have a vehicle where leaders can be tested. And the advisory team is, and it's a very specific, you know, you need to use this, this terminology, advisory team. You don't want to call an advisory board. You want to call an advisory advisory team. A lot of our, a lot of our church planners call them the A-teams now. But these are people that you have uh, worked with, you have uh, uh, pulled together, who, you know, as you, as you can see, have a, a level of spiritual maturity, uh, have a level of commitment to the vision of the church, have, have displayed that commitment in, in a variety of ways. And, um, um, and now you're going to pull them into a smaller team of people who are going, who are going to assist you uh, in leading the church as advisors. Here's a definition that we use right out of our first steps manual. You know, although the advisory team has some elder-like functions, it's not an elder board. Um, we actually have a, a job description uh, on the First Steps uh, Network site. So, the member of this team, uh, as a, uh, the member of this of this team, um, serve as trusted advisors, wise counselors to the church planting pastor. But the advisory team has no decision-making power until the new church becomes self-governing. The church planting pastor, under the oversight of, of their sending agency or mother church, has the final decision-making authority. And so what you want to do is you want to have this advisory team, but it becomes a testing ground for, um, for, your, uh, uh, for your potential leaders. Now, one of the things that I've, I've uh, been impressed uh, upon lately is that when you look at the characteristics of an elder or a deacon uh, in, in, Tim, in, in Timothy, um, it's amazing to me that how many of those characteristics deal with emotional maturity. And so one of the things that you're looking at in this advisory time when you pull people in and you say, hey, I'd like to get your advice on stuff and like you to be a part of this team, um, is that you're looking for people who are emotionally mature. Uh, and you're looking at people who carry themselves well. You want to see how they interact in the meeting. One of my planters uh, had a team, an advisory team he was pulling together, and they had the opportunity of buying a building early on in their church plant uh, within the first two years, and they began talking and discussing as, this, as, as an advisory team about this. But in the midst of it, I mean, he, he called me and said, man, it just got ugly. I mean, I couldn't believe that, that what came out of... Uh, some of these men in some of their in some of their lives and just the ugliness of the meeting and I said well number one you don't make those guys el they never make those guys elders uh, and um, and and number two you go and get you keep focused on the people who are healthy and who handle themselves well in those meetings I had one of my planters say that he had, you know especially with younger church planters when they're when they're younger and they have older people on their uh, advisory team or older people in the life of their church. Um, one planter had an initial kind of advisory team meeting, and this guy started off by slamming his fist on the desk and saying, well, here's how it's going to go, Pastor. And, uh, and boom, I had to actually come in and have exit counsel that guy out of, out of the life of the church. Um, again, uh, look at those characteristics of a uh, of an elder of a deacon, and look at how many of those deal with emotional maturity. But the advisory team gives you a great opportunity to spot and look and develop and test potential leaders, and uh, and that's what, one of the things we want to want to encourage you to develop uh, during your launch team. And I would keep it smaller. I would not have it big. I wouldn't have it. I would not have couples on the team. Uh, if you're going to have um, men and women on the team, I would not have couples. I would have uh, uh, individuals who represent the family, um, and 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 so those are those are some of the things that you want to 
take a look at. Stage four, the, and the question four, how you get to raise the evangelistic temperature in your in your church? This is a rule that I uh, picked up from um, uh, Bill Eason, and uh, you know it's the 100 to 300 rule, and it basically says that if your new church is going to have 10% uh, conversion growth in the first 100, um, it will have 10% 10, 10 conversion growth at 300. And then I would add that that number will drop more and more over the life of the church. And if you have 70% conversion growth the first 100, you'll probably have 70% 70, 70 conversion growth at 300. Why is that? It's because there is what I call an evangelistic DNA that's set in the life of the church. An evangelistic DNA that's set in the life of the church. Uh, one of the things that I was, as a, as a new church planter, 28 years old, I was so frustrated because I couldn't get the, you know, the, the mature believers to join my team. And so I built, we really built our church on conversion growth and on people coming back to Christ. Um, and we had about 80% you know, conversion growth uh, on our launch team and it within the first year of our new church. Well, after 10 years of being there, 10 years, we had about 70% of our church were people who came to who came to Christ or came back to Christ uh, through our through our ministry, and the interesting thing was we weren't the church that all the Christians went to when they moved to town. Uh, they would come to our church and they would go, "Man, this church feels so unstable because there's so many new Christians here." And uh, you know, I look back at that with great fondness and a great encouragement. I was uh, uh, just. About a month ago, two months ago, I had uh, actually two months of this day, I, I was invited back to the town where we planted our church and uh, had a number of people over. Uh, they threw a party for me. It was my birthday. And I was sitting in this room, about 40 people, and I couldn't believe, you know, that basically the majority of the people in that, that room were people I had the privilege of baptizing. And uh, there's no greater joy in seeing that happen. And so, Setting this evangelistic DNA is critical. I remember we began hire, church got big enough that I began hiring staff from around the country, and I remember our staff on Monday mornings are going, "This church just feels so unstable. There's so many new Christians." And and I said, "Man, what would you want? What you know? This is what you guys told me you want to be a part of a a church that reaches people. That's what we're doing. So now we got to disciple them. Now we've got to grow them up in their faith, and we got to see them." Uh, thriving, you know, spiritually, and uh, and so um, those were uh, uh, those were those are very fond days uh, in the life of our church. Here's a couple insights just on how to how to set the evangelistic DNA uh, during the launch team phase. Number one, the planter must model evangelism. You need to be getting into spiritual conversations. On a on a consistent basis. Uh, last time we met, we talked about sharing, learning how to share 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 three stories that will generate spiritual conversations. One, you need to learn how to share the story of of God's call uh, on your life to plant this to plant the church. Why are you planting a church in this city? And you need to share that in, in a compelling way that will generate what spiritual interest. You need to be able to share your faith story, your own personal faith story, in a way that's going to generate spiritual conversations. And you need to be able to tell God's story uh, well and in a, in a way that's going to just generate those spiritual conversations. Uh, the planter must inspire the team to think missionally. You know, I mean, the Great Commission passage, uh, it says go and make disciples, but all of us know that, you know, the real wording there is as you go. And see, thinking missionally is what I call as-you-go thinking. Is that wherever we go, we take the mission. We are on mission with God. And uh, whether it's the workplace, whether it's a vacation, we are not. You know, um, uh, we're we are never. Um, uh, let's let's say uh, off the clock, in in one sense. Uh, we are always on mission. You need to inspire your team to think missionally. Um, you do that by constantly helping them think outward, outward uh, from an outward focus mentality. 
um, encouraging them to pray and to develop a prayer list of people who who they want to share their faith with, who they want to invite to a, a seeker study or invite to an outreach event. Um, number three, you need to, the planter must equip the team in the basic in, in basic evangelistic skills. Uh, I'm just uh, you know amazed at the lack of evangelism training that's going on in our churches today. And uh, and one of the things I strongly encourage planters to do is to find a tool, uh, a tool that that will mark their church, an evangelistic tool that will mark their church. You know, when you think of Campus Crusade, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is the four spiritual laws. You know, when you think of navigators, you think the br- the bridge to life. These organizations trained their people in 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 basic evangelism skills and help them develop, uh, um, help them use a tool in a proficient manner. And you need to do this, uh, especially during the launch team phase and in an ongoing uh, effort uh, in the life of your church. And so what I encourage planters to pick a tool, whatever it is, and, uh, and impress that upon your people. Uh, so you'll have an evangelistic uh, tool or method a way to share the gospel. One of our guys is is uh, one of our church planters now is uh, really just driving home the Romans road. He wants everybody in his church to know how to share the Romans road with somebody, and uh, and that that's what's marking their life, marking the life of their church uh, in in articulating their faith and articulating the gospel in a very basic way. Planter must plan and provide a variety of outreach opportunities. One of the things you need to do is you need to kind of bring people along uh, in what I would call entry-level evangelistic or outreach focus uh, tasks. That could start off by just simply community service uh, and and doing community service, uh, loving your city uh, incarnationally um, by serve by serving your city. Uh, it could take place um, through prayer walking, you know, getting people out out of their house, onto the streets, and prayer walking their neighborhoods, helping them see their community through the eyes of Jesus. It could involve uh, servant evangelism. I'm a big proponent of, of servant evangelism and Steve Shogren's material and uh, servantevangelism.com. You need to, you need, that's one of my favorite church planning sites. Um, there's over 200 activities, 200 outreach ideas on that site of, of getting out and in, in getting your people out in a way to earn the right to be heard, uh, to uh, serve them or give them a gift that will uh, 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 give them an opportunity to just love people uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, share who they are and what church they're a part of. Um, it's, it's critical. Uh, so plan and provide those activities. I think you need to, you know, do these do these weekly. You know, in the launch team phase, especially in the launch team phase, weekly or every other week. Uh, the, our last the church plant we're involved in right now, our the planting pastor there uh, decided that he was going to do launch team meetings every other Sunday night, and then uh, the ever every the the, the next uh, the off week were weeks we were spent in doing outreach, um, serving evangelism. We did what they called uh, um, adventure trips. And one of the things we did is we uh, had some adventurists in our uh, in our church who you could teach rock climbing and kayaking and all this. And so we actually did trips uh, for the whole purpose of, you know, the purpose was for you to invite a non-church person to go on uh, the kind of this pre-evangelism trip where there wasn't a program, it was just hanging out with other, you know, with people. Um, but those were those were events that, that we did. And then uh, the planter must see conversion growth in the launch team phase. I mean, you must, you need to be on your knees praying that God will uh, allow you to see people come to faith in Christ before you even launch your church, before you even have um, a public worship service. Uh, that it's going to be critical. It's going to be critical uh, for you to see that, what I call the, that evangelistic DNA set in your life of your church. 
it's interesting. Uh, when I planted our church, we had, um, uh, during the launch team phase, we baptized five individuals, uh, five people who came to Christ and, and wanted to be baptized. And, and so during that, that first phase, we, we baptized that. And so I, I've been sharing that story, you know, for the last 20 years with church planters. And uh, now it's actually become, it's part of our culture uh, in, our, in our church planting um, uh, movement. And, uh, and, and now we have people who are, you know, just wanting to see how many baptisms they can have before they actually uh, plant their church. Here's a young man, uh, Joe, Joe uh, Basil, here in the Chicago area. Uh, he's got the record right now that I know of. Uh, he had about, I think they did 33 baptisms uh, before they actually launched the church, did the, first, uh, the official grand opening of their, of their new church. And uh, uh, had another another gentleman that was could be close to that. I think he was over 20 uh, baptisms that uh, uh, took place before he had launched his uh, his church. And now some of our actually we've had a couple of our new churches actually do um, baptismal services at their grand opening. And what a way what a way to do a, a public baptism service uh, on the on the launch of your church. So, yeah, let's. You got to make sure conversion growth is going to happen during the during the launch team phase. Here's a couple of questions just to reflect on as we uh, um, wind up, and then we'll get ready for some Q and A. You know, how will your how will how will <clears throat> you know your launch team is on the same page? Um, how are you going to test those potential leaders on your launch team? Uh, you know, one of the things that I always t tell our planters, um, you know, make sure during the launch team phase you're taking offerings, because uh, as uh, Jim Griffiths has said, um, I love I love his comment here. How do you know that people are on are on your team with you? He said, there's three ways. Number one, their money's in the pot. Number two, their money's in the pot. Number three, their money's in the pot. And uh, if people are not financially committed to your cause, they're really not on your team. And uh, you need to you need to find find ways of testing those potential leaders. Um, you know what what are going to be some of the qualifications for those on your launch team? Uh, and then uh, you know how will you keep uh, the evangelist fervor alive during the during the launch team phase? All right, I guess we can go to some Q&A now. All right. Well, thanks, Gary. Um, real quick, um, this is the, hopefully be the easiest question. Can you repeat the um, name of the site with the 200-plus? Um, yeah, it's servantevangelism.com. All right. I will uh, type that in here for everyone to access. And, um, yeah, we have... Quite a few questions that came in here. Um, one, going back to um, your story of terminating that uh, original launch team mm -hmm. um, or, or, or core group, um, the question is, is, is why, if you can repeat that, why is a definable termination point necessary? Um, or maybe how do you sense that? How do you know when you've gone too long right? and, uh, and it's time to terminate? Yeah, well, I think if I think you know this is what, what we've learned over over time. I mean, I obviously had to learn it the hard way, um, and then um, as we you know as you plant more churches, you learn. Every time we plant a church, we learn something, and so we've just seen over time that if we use the launch team terminology, that team is to gather for a purpose. It, it has its purpose right in its name. This the purpose of this group is to launch the church. And uh, and so, um, actually, in the in the first steps manual and then on the site um, and in our training, we go really into depth on this, in um, in, a, in a whole sequence of how to build a team and then how to you know uh, and actually actually after their church is launched and some do it before the church is launched or maybe even the the Saturday before the grand opening. They'll actually pull the team together and they'll celebrate what God's done, 
and uh, and at that point they'll say, you know what, from now on we don't refer to ourselves as a launch team. Uh, we just refer to ourselves as a part of this this new church, because you want you want to you know the whole idea of launching is to be inclusive of others, and um, um, and so that's you know part of part of that dynamic. Uh, some of our planters now what they'll do is maybe two months later after the church is launched. They'll actually celebrate, especially if they if they do a fall launch. They'll actually have a Christmas party with the launch team, and uh, and give them a gift. Like our pastor gave us, our church is called North Bridge Church, and he actually gave us a book of bridges, and he wrote a personal note inside it, saying, you know, I want to thank you for for launching this church and and and, and really living out our vision to build to build bridges uh, into our community with the gospel of Christ. And uh, mm-hmm. and so he gave us a gift, and then basically at that point he said we're no longer going to be, you know, called the launch team. We're going to be this is more going to be more of a, a leadership team, uh, leadership community within the church, but um, uh, because we want to be inclusive of everybody who's come since the church is launched. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, along those lines, um, in terms of outreach, how do you maintain a balance between? Um, caring for those who are currently in your network uh, of relationships, um, but also stretching beyond that and stretching others beyond that to, to see and, and to build and increase their level of, of connection with people in the community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's always a fine balance and, uh, and, and but I would say this that uh, you know you're going to spend time in pastoral care and uh, and shepherding, encouraging, and building and building up uh, people in their faith. Um, uh, and uh, but you need to, you need to you need to um, have that focused time and energy. I mean, uh, you know, Bob Logan talks about that about you know during the networking phase. Uh, the building phase, kind of before you launch, you need to be spending about 70% of your time in networking, evangelism, and outreach. And uh, and then what I tell tell our planters is that after you've launched your church, you need to figure out how to how to how to keep a, a healthy balance and really spending about 20% of your energy and time in outreach um, and outreach in in community service and and networking the community um, and really encouraging uh, believers to do that. So, you know, that's, that's always the struggle. There's, there's this, the, the entropy that takes place. We call it in our, in the church plant landmines, but we call it evangelistic entropy that take that takes place. And the, the planters always going to be fighting that. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, because if you're going to keep your church on a, a level of being fully engaged in God's mission, um, you know that you're going to need to have that clear outreach focus. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice pastoral care. Uh, you know, you want to raise up those who have shepherding gifts and pastoral gifts um, and empower them uh, to be caring for other for other believers. Yeah. With that, what have you found to be effective, um, given the diversity of gifts when you have evangelists and, and shepherds and teachers and apostles? Um, should they all be on um, or part of a launch team? What have you found to be effective in um, in orchestrating all of those gifts for uh, for God's purposes in that community? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I think. You know, one you want to you want to you want everybody to be you know what I said thinking missionally, okay, that they're not off the clock and that um, not we're not all we we don't all have the gift of evangelism, but we can all have we can all think missionally, and we can all have an outreach uh, focus and an outreach spirit, um, and so I think you know you need to um, continue to to foster that uh, in. in in the church and in in the life of the church, and people are going to have different evangelistic styles. That's why I think the contagious Christian material is great because people are going to have a, a variety of evangelistic styles that need to be expressed. 
Um, but we all we need to all be engaged in it uh, at some level. Um, and so, just con- you know, continuing you know to have people serve in their giftedness in the area of of ministry, but with that men- outreach mentality always um, at the forefront. Uh, what I like to call just missional, missional thinking or as you go kind of a spirit uh, always happening in the in the life of uh, of the life of your church and mm-hmm. you know I think um, you know the the whole idea that uh, uh, um, you know the, the, this entropy it's just it's good it can, it's going to wind down and if you're going to have you know continue to, to engaged in seeing lost people come to your Christ, um, you need to have, you know, as a leader, you need to be the one kind of being that, you know, the law of entropy says that if there's no outsor- outside energy, you know, um, uh, things are going to actually wind down mm-hmm. and uh, and collapse. And so there needs to be an outside energy force. And well, that's leadership. And um, the churches that uh, have leaders who just continue to champion uh, that outreach mentality and missional thinking are the ones that uh, really continue to have uh, uh, a long-term conversion growth. Mm-hmm. Now, how necessary is it for the uh, individual church planter to um, provide that evangelistic energy? Um, Could it come from someone else on the team? Well, it could. It could. But um, you know, if people don't see you getting engaged and talking about the spiritual conversations you're getting involved in, uh, one a planter I co- coached early on in the life of of my coaching career, uh, what he did is he had his launch team meetings on Wednesdays, and he spent basically he was in a college town, and so he spent Wednesday afternoons, about four hours on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, you know, mingling in coffee shops and just seeking mm. to get into spiritual conversation. So he had fresh stories to tell. And, mm. and so what we tell planters, you know, tell your stories. Tell the tell the tell the, the great glorious stories, you know, of, of of the spiritual conversation and tell the ones the where you embarrass yourself and where you you stumbled and bumbled, you know. Uh mm-hmm. but be authentic and be real be, because not every spiritual conversation goes well. Yeah. And uh but you're engaged in it and I think that's the important thing of modeling that the planter needs to model that spirit of building relationships with unchurched people, be getting uh actively engaged in the community. Uh we talked about last time that networking is more about joining something than it is about hanging out somewhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so getting joining the chamber of commerce and joining a subcommittee in the chamber of commerce or joining some service group uh, where you're at where you're around uh, uh, people who are God fearers and and people who are far from God and uh, is is really is really going to be critical. Yeah, yeah. So um, shifting, shifting gears just a bit, uh, when thinking about the advisory team and particularly who's on it. Uh, for those who are uh, closely connected with a mother church, um, would you recommend members of the mother church being on the advisory team or a mix, or would they, um, would the members of the, the advisory team, um, would you want them to come from exclusively outside of the mother church? Yeah, there there are actually two types of teams. Uh, there there is the um, what I would say the official. Uh, uh, in, a, in a sense, directors or uh, those who actually, um, you know, the legal the legal directors of the new church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and typically, what we do is we have those have those as maybe two pastors or two lately, especially in a mother church situation. Um, those they would be it would be the planter and then two either two pastors who are part of the organization that's starting the church or two elders from the mother church, that would actually be the official directors, the ones who are basically who sign the bylaws uh, for your for your state, okay? Um, mm-hmm. and, the, and so they're, they're the actual ones who are um, the, you know, uh, the official leaders of the plant in that sense. 
the, the advisory team is really built of people who are going to be long-term in the life of the church um, and who are, could be potential elders. And uh, that could take up to three years, you know, for you to find those potential elders. And then once you, once the church does get, get elders um, that are part of that, that other team, the, the legal, what I call directors uh, of the church, in a sense, um, um, they actually sign over the church to this new group of elders, thus the church becoming self-governing. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, typically the, the way you want to look at it. But the advisory team is more really built up of people who are in the life of the church um, because that's a testing ground for future for future leaders. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. really two Great. separate teams. Oh, that's, that's good. That's good. Um, for those who are just starting out, um, what advice would you give a planter um, with, a, with a team that uh, is new to an area, let's say they've all uh, either been sent or all have gathered in um, a particular community, what advice would you give them? Uh, can you repeat that one more time again? Yeah, for um, uh, a planter and um, his or her young staff has or young team has moved to a new community or a new area, um, what advice would you give them for some um, initial first steps? So they're they're it's in like a pioneer church plan, mm-hmm. just moving new to an area. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, you know you uh, again you want to get out in your community. One of the things that happens, you know, we we talk about starting with a team, which is really incur you know what we encourage that we encourage team planting. But Ed Stetzer in his book, um, uh, you know. Planting a church in a postmodern culture, he talks mm-hmm. about the danger of it and some resources. That what what happens is, is that the team can be just hang out and uh, with each other and not really get out into the community. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so what I would say is that you know you'd come together. I think you you, you have a weekly meeting. That uh, this new team is comes together weekly for prayer. And then really holds each other accountable about the spiritual conversations they're getting involved in, and how they're uh, integrating themselves into the life of the community. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, it's it's critical. Um, you know, as you one of the things that I really challenge pastors with if they want to really raise the evangelistic temperature of the church is, you know, your staff meetings. You need to be talking about, you know, having staff share the spiritual conversations they're getting into weekly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, especially if you have a larger church, I mean, your staff should be getting, should be in having spiritual conversations on a weekly basis uh, with people who are, you know, struggling w- with their faith or people who are, uh, you know, far from God or people who are seeking or searching. Um, there are plenty of opportunities and I just think you need to be disciplined in that and it needs to be championed by the leader and holding holding the team accountable in those areas. Mm-hmm. So that that'd be, you know, my advice there is don't get caught up with hanging out with each other and uh building community with each other. Have that balance of challenging each other to live missionally, uh, to get into spiritual conversations, to figure out ways of of joining and integrating into the life of the community. Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, essentially, be the church, um, mm-hmm. live the life of the church, um, and, and take the church <laughs> to the community. Right. Is what I hear you saying. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, one last one here. One last question. Um, uh, one community and church is. Um, Pursuing a, a small group model, um, launching small groups in January, even though their uh, official launch date isn't until September, um, would you uh, suggest that as these small groups grow and multiply, that they begin to gather even now, or, or even when they have critical mass, or should they wait until September to actually gather um, for the first time? Yeah, I think, uh, um, and, and they're doing a. a they're creating is this uh 
you know, are they going to uh, create, you know, I'd have to ask more questions about um, um, is this going to be a house church strategy or is it more of a, you know, sell the celebration strategy? Um, you know, that that would be the mm-hmm. critical piece. Are they going to have a weekly public worship gathering? Um, you know, that, that, that a lar- the lar- you know that the larger crowd can come to. Uh, if that's if if that's the way they're going to go, I would say that you know get the small groups going, kind of that gathering phase. But once you get you know 20 to 30 people, I would say start gathering them in the launch team phase because your launch team the the launch team meetings are really training meetings uh, to launching this larger service. The larger public service, and uh, and 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 growing, growing those small groups also. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I would say you would, you know, if you're going to launch in September, you want to have those meetings before then. So. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, Gary, uh, we have a couple minutes left here. Are there any uh, last words or parting words you'd like to leave with us? Well, you know, I think you got to, you know. One of the things that uh, this whole idea of building uh, a team is just it's a it's a great opportunity uh, that you have and uh, uh, I'm just going to end with this quote from uh, this legendary uh, uh, coach football coach of uh, um, he was the his name was Red Blake and uh, he was with uh, he was the mentor of Vince Lombardi. And uh, he said these words. He says, once in a while you're lucky enough to have the thrill and satisfaction of working with a group of men who are willing to make every sacrifice to achieve a goal and then experiencing, then experience the, the achieving of it with them. In this, believe me, there is a payment that cannot be matched in any other pursuit. And, uh, you know, he's talking about a football team there, okay, and, and winning football games and championships. But, you know, we have an opportunity to build a team. And, and I've been a part of, you know, four teams, you know, that uh, um, people that are, uh, there's there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it to see, to work together, to see, um, uh, you know, the gospel being advanced through us, uh, and uh and seeing lives transformed and seeing churches established and so uh you know take you know build your team with care build your team with 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 prayer <laughs> and uh and build your team with wise counsel and uh and with skill um and keep them keep them focused uh on the goal indeed indeed well, Gary, thank you so much for walking us through this uh, critical step of, of planting a missional church, and we really appreciate you um, sharing your insights with us. Um, we want to thank also all the attendees and participants who joined us today. Uh, I realize we didn't get to all of your questions, and so I will forward your questions on to Gary, and you are free to um, – he may respond to those on his blog, and so uh, feel free to, to check out his blog periodically to see if um, he responds to your particular question. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about today's webinar, feel free to email uh, me at johnvb at coachnet.org or at support at coachnet.org, and I'll be glad to um, address your questions or comments. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that this webinar is being recorded and will be available from the CoachNet website uh, within a few hours, and so feel free to, to check back on our webcast page. Um, it will be posted there when it is all edited and ready to go. Well, wherever you are in your journey, uh, we hope that you'll invite us along as together we seek to to see God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we look forward to connecting with you again in the future. God bless.